I'm still trying to catch my breath. That was that was something else. Man. Hello, I'm Mason Brock Henderson. This is a late night review. And Fargo. Right episode before the season finale, season two, and I last week I was full of praise for what a great job they've done taking a completely new story from season one in such a short amount of episodes, building it up so well. But this is this is the episode. This is the episode where everything everything just happens. Everything happens. Like this this is the episode. Last season, this episode was same same thing, episode nine, right before the finale. Everything happens. Everything happens right before the finale, and then the finale is just how it ends. Same thing here. Absolutely incredible. I I I can't think of enough words to talk about how great this show is. Like they have done such an amazing job. And it's I'm worried that this review may go on for a while because there's a lot of stuff to talk about, a lot of good stuff to talk about. Um, but first of all, opening with that book, that was genius. There's a book on the shelf that is, you know, crime stories, and it opens up and has the lines of dialogue. This is a true story. The events depicted took place in, you know, Minnesota. All that stuff written in the book, and then it open up, cause totally forgot about this, but they opened up showing the TV or the movie about the massacre at Sioux Falls. And is this told from somebody's point of view? Like, is this all told from somebody's point of view? Is this, is that where they're going with this? So many questions that just, I, I, I don't believe it was for no reason. You know, I don't believe this, you know, starting off with the movie, the massacre at Sioux Falls, having this book, you know, opening up, talking about the story. I don't believe it for, was for no reason, and there was at least one reason, one major reason in this episode. Hansi Dent, the, the Gerhardt's Indian as they call him. His story, oh my gosh, just brilliantly handled, absolutely brilliantly. The fact that they have the book opening means that they have a narrator, and now this narrator is able to talk about his motivations that are still unknown today. You know, why is he doing all this? Nobody really knows, you know, when did he decide to stop? Well, it could have been here, it could have been here, but nobody really knows when. And it just, it fits so perfectly. Like, they have not done that in any other episode, and they decided to do it for this episode specifically because of Hanzi Den for his story. You know, when when exactly did he decide to to betray the Gauss? Let's Let's take a look at his motivations. It could have been right here. Or well, it could have been right there. <laughs> just I I never would have imagined that they take it that way. And they do it. And it just and, and even the way it opens up, you know, it's talking about how we're getting to the bloodiest part of this whole conflict. And just that builds the anticipation for this episode. You know, is it all gonna happen at the end of this or is it building up until the finale when that's the bloodshed? No, it just it all happens at the end of this episode. Um, and once again, bringing in elephants, elephants, elements of Fargo, um, because you got Lou, who is the sensible cop, you've got Hank, who's the sen sensible cop, and all these other guys are just idiots. You know, the, the one cop is just like, you're outranked here by like five different people, you just need to get out of here. Uh, the, the little wimpy cop who's like, I thought you were... You know, I thought you were Gary Cooper. It turns out you were more whatever. Um, and you just, you know that they're making such dumb decisions through all of this. You know they're going to die. <laughs> it was just, it's one of those moments that they did very well in this case, but I haven't seen it a lot. So I'm just like, yeah, you're making a bunch of dumb decisions and you're you're going to die. Um, but, you know, it, it, it was done in a good way. It's not... Anytime they've done something that's a little bit cliche, they've done it in a way that makes it feel not as cliche. Um, 
And I, I like it whenever they can do that, whenever they can take a cliche and make it feel original. And they did it very well here. So all of this is just building up. You've got the cops making dumb decisions. You've got, you know, Lou trying to talk sense into them. They're not listening. Uh, Hank decides he's going to stick around, you know, try, try to help them out, try to talk them out of it. And of course, they're not listening to him either. And then you've got, uh, you've got Hansi in the middle of it all. You know, he, he's watching them go to this hotel, then he calls uh, the Gerhards. And two episodes ago, it ended with him calling them and saying he that, that he had found Dodd. And so, going through last episode to now, and as soon as they got the call, I was like, so he called, he's the one that killed Dodd, and he called them after, that's interesting. Like, cause when he made that call, we didn't know Dodd was dead, and we especially didn't know that Dodd was killed by him and then they go into that little the narrator talks about you know nobody knows it's highly debated about the next two words that came out of Hansi's mouth nobody really knows when he decided to betray the care hearts blah 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 all that stuff and just really it kind of says that this character make your own decision you know what do you why do you think he betrays them why do you think that he made this decision to betray them and that's very clever I mean it first of all it takes a lot of guts to say Okay, audience, you make you decide. And I talked about this. Um, what was it? Was it? I think it was two episodes ago, maybe, or maybe it was three episodes. The one where uh, Dodd and the Gear Hearts try to get to the Blomquist, and then it shows him like down in the basement, and it shows it all from his point of view while Peggy's off screen doing all this stuff before she finally takes him down. And I talked about how it was very brilliant of them to kind of leave it up to our imagination. What's going on off screen? You know, is she is she just a secret badass? Is she just taking them all down? You know, like ninja st Is she is she like scared and maybe just doing it by luck? Like she pushes the guy and he falls into the sink and then she like sees it and like grabs it timidly. You know, what what is she doing off screen? You decide. Same thing here. What is his motivation? Why is he doing all this? You decide. That's very, that's very brilliant. That's very gutsy, and I really do appreciate the fact that they have the guts to do something like that, to take that chance, to say, we're not, we're not going to tell you what his motivations are because we want you to decide for yourself. What is, what are his motivations? You know, he had plenty, plenty of motivation, plenty of opportunities, but what is the one thing that decided that he was going to, you know, that he was going to betray them? And just my opinion it's very interesting to you know because there was that moment with Dodd last week where he calls him a mongrel he's like just shoot the mongrel let's go and then he shoots Dodd that could have been the tipping point but it seemed like he was already kind of not listening to Dodd before that so there are other instances where it kind of feels like well they're treating him like crap so I could see why he might want to you know betray them so like I said very very good move very interesting and very well done by the writers uh, but he does, he tells the Gerhards that Kansas City is at this hotel with Dodd and with the Butcher. And so they're coming full force. You've got all of the the South Dakota, I think, police. They're, they're waiting there for the, the meeting with Mike Milligan. Uh, they're going to strap a wire to, to Ed and have him do the meeting, which of course, you know, Lou's like, he's going to see through that, he's not stupid. The cops just like looky here. You get out of here. I know what I'm doing. Uh, Hank is just along for the ride, hoping maybe he can talk some sense into him, hoping he can be there to help out if anything goes wrong. Um, and so all of this is going on. You see, <laughs> you can see all of this stuff that's just building up. And you, I I know this has happened a lot before, but there are these moments that just make you want to face palm, <laughs> like. They're all these decisions. Yeah, they're gonna go white shirts and jeans. You know, all the cops, so they don't. They're not wearing cop uniforms. Why? First of all, that looks suspicious. All of you wearing the same blank white shirt with jeans. And secondly, like, it's just you. You know that obviously they're doing it because the meeting with Michael Milligan. He doesn't want to see cop uniforms. 
but because the Gearhearts are coming, it's like, okay, of course, like, they're gonna get there, not see that they're cops, things are gonna go wrong. And then they turn off the radio. <laughs> you, you, it's, it's solely because Lou's gonna try to call in, and the radio's off, so that's not gonna work. Um, so it's like all the decisions they're making are kind of the right decisions, but at the same time they're kind of dumb. And it's the reason why all of this goes wrong. You know, just these little, little small decisions here and there that just make it all, you can see where it's going to go wrong. You just, little plan going forward. Oh, okay, yeah, that's going to go wrong. That's going to go wrong. This is all going to go very, very wrong. <laughs> you know, just, um, but anyway, so all of this is building up. There's just kind of, there's an emotional scene. There's a whole lot of emotions in this episode. Uh, Lou, for one. Like, you just see, you see all the emotions on his face, where a lot of this show has been kind of quirky, you know, the people, the people that are acting like idiots are acting like quirky idiots, but Lou, he's the one serious one, you know, like, even Hank, he has his quirks, you know, he's, he's serious, he's not dumb, but he has his quirky moments. Lou has been just very serious through all of this. He's like the one, he's the one that's normal, you know, that we can relate to. And so that's why in this moment when he he goes to check on uh, Peggy's friend who apparently was strangled by the uh, by Hansi after their little encounter, um, he he walks out and sees the Gerhards driving towards the motel, and so he's like runs into runs to his car and is driving towards the motel trying to call them, and they've got like this dramatic music playing as the radio is off and they're not answering. You can see this look of just fear and worry on his face because he knows that things are about to go bad. Very intense moment. Um, very well done too. Uh, and before I, I continue on, I should talk about the other emotional moment. Betsy finally she she has the moment where I think the cancer finally kind of gets to her physically and uh, she collapses which Molly walks in and sees her collapse on the floor and then they have another moment where Lou's trying to call the house and obviously they don't answer. So, like like I said in previous reviews, in season one we know that you know Molly said something about her mom dying when she was young so I knew it was going to happen. I always said I wasn't sure if she was going to die in this season or if they were just going to leave it off if she's got cancer um, or if she was even going to die as a result of everything going on with the war. So, you know, they're, they're not, they didn't show if she was dead, she just, she collapsed. Um, so I hope there is at least a resolution, and I hope, you know, Lou at least gets a, a last chance to be with her, because that would really suck for him to have been drawn away by all of this stuff and not get a final goodbye to her. Um, that would just, talk about a sad ending, that would be the saddest of sad. So, you know, it's, <laughs> all of this emotion is building, all of this tension is building. The Gerhards finally arrive at the hotel. They take out the one guy. Um, Floyd and Hansi are hanging back and just like, that's, that's not going to go very well. <laughs> um, knowing that he, you know, knowing that he's betrayed them, knowing that he, for some reason, has turned on them. And so, you know, Bear is leading the charge. He's got them all outside of the rooms, and gunfight ensues. He goes in, takes out the two cops, takes out the the chief, which, you know, it kind of makes me feel a little bit morbid, because whenever the chief was taken, I was like, huzzah. <laughs> um, maybe that was just me. Maybe they made his character very unlikable, so whenever he did die, it was like, okay, <laughs> I'll take it. Um, but, you know, obviously they bust into the other rooms. There's one where these four cops are playing poker. And, or maybe it was three cops. I can't remember. Uh, but, you know, they take out one. The other two are fighting back. They break into Hank's room. And he's he is, was, like, wide awake. He couldn't sleep. So he gets up and uh, is putting on his uniform before they kick it down. So when they kick it down, he takes out the first guy. And then he's hiding in the bathroom shooting at the second guy. Uh, and then Ed and Peggy's in the final room with the the Weasley-looking look, little cop. 
and one of the guys busts in there, and Peggy, because she couldn't sleep, I don't know, she's, I'm going to talk about Peggy in a second, but, you know, she apparently got them ready, she and Ed hide in the bathroom while the one guy comes in, Weasley cop closes the door and shoots the guy, Peggy, of course, because, you know, like I said, I'll talk about her character in a second, but she grabs a gun, nails him in the head, knocks him out, and so all of this stuff is going on. You know, they've got a firefight going on. And Bear, looking for Dodd, comes out, can't find him. Somebody shouts, they're cops. That's when Floyd looks at Hansi and realizes something's wrong. He stabs her. And I'm like, what? Like, he killed... Okay? <laughs> what? And it was one of those things that I, I kind of kind of sort of predicted I was like he might kill her but I didn't actually expect him to do it I didn't expect it to actually happen and you know like I talk shows like The Walking Dead there's a lot of predictions that can be made I can see stuff about to go wrong and sometimes they go through with it like um there, there's one character that died uh last th during the fifth season and I was like you know she they they might die, but I don't think they would. And then they do it, and I was like, oh my god. Same thing for this. Like, I never... I didn't expect him to kill off. I knew she might die at some point. But I didn't expect her to die right now by his hand. Like, I was just... I, I couldn't believe they actually went through with it. Um, and so Bear, like, sees that and starts charging. Eerie gets shot off by Lou. So he charges at Lou, takes a few more shots. But because... I guess because they call him Bear... Um, just doesn't feel it and keeps going and, you know, tackles him to the ground. They're fighting, they're wrestling. Hansi takes his gun, starts shooting up everybody. Like, just Cop and Gerhardt alike. You know, shoots them up. And once again, the narrator comes in, says, you know, as she was shooting up friend and foe. And even gets a shot on Hank, but, you know, gut shot, so I'm hoping maybe not that bad. I don't want Hank to die right now. Obviously, he does die at some point because he's not in season one, but I'm hoping it's because of old age. I don't want Hank to die. But, you know, narrator's talking about why did he want, you know, why was he on his personal vendetta? Why did he want Ed and Peggy dead? And so he's about to, like, kick down the room. Peggy shoots through the door with a shotgun, nearly gets him, but doesn't. You see uh, Bear, like, choking out Lou on the ground. You're just like, oh, my God, he can't die. Wait, he doesn't die, because he was in season one. <laughs> and so, you know, one of those moments where you're just like, okay, something's about to happen, Hank's about to save him. UFO comes out of the sky. <laughs> I'm just like, wait, what? Hang on a minute. I'm confused. <laughs> and this is, this is the only part of the episode that I was kind of like, okay... Let's just take a let's just take a break for a second. We need to talk about some stuff. Um, do aliens exist in this universe? And obviously, it's a fictional. So if they want to have a UFO, fine by me. In fact, first episode, the reason that Ride gets hit by the car is because he sees a UFO-like object. Um, now, will this play into the final story? I don't know. But it's kind of a deus ex machina in this case. It comes out of the sky. Bear gets distracted. Um, what's his face? Hanzi gets distracted. And so because Bear's distracted, Lou takes the chance to grab his pistol, shoot him in the head. Bear's dead. I'm just like, wait, wait, wait. They, wait. Hang on a minute. Lou just did a headshot on Bear. Bear's dead. They're just killing off everybody. <laughs> like, it was just all these people dying. I'm just like, oh my god. Like, they just... I hate the fact that this is a late night review because I can't scream. I... You don't understand my pain right now. I can't make a lot of noise, but I want to. Because this episode was crazy, man. It just, it blew my mind. They killed all these people. They said at the beginning of the episode, now we're coming to the bloodiest chapter. I'm just like, okay. Okay, so some people are gonna... Everybody dies. 
everybody. Cops all die. Gerhardt's all die. The only people that don't die, obviously Lou, because he makes it. Hank, as far as I can tell, seems okay. You know, it's just a gut shot, it seems. And Peggy obviously make it out because their story is still going on. They have one more episode. Hansi is still alive because he's got a vendetta against them. And then Mike Milligan and the Kitchen Brother. They're still alive. That's that's pretty much it. Even Betsy might be dead. Like, <laughs> everybody died. <laughs> it's just, it blows my mind. And it, it, going into this... They were talking about the Sioux Falls mass massacre at the very beginning. They're talking about how it's one of the, like, the most bloodiest, most bloodiest is not grammatically correct, but it's one of the bloodiest times in Minnesota history. And so going in, it's not like I didn't know what what this was going to happen. I didn't. It's not like I didn't know that this this episode was coming. But when it all finally happens, they just did it so well and so so action-packed that it just it gets the adrenaline pumping you're like oh my god they died oh my god they died oh my god they died everybody's dying <laughs> just <sighs> I had to take a breath because <laughs> episodes like this just get the blood flowing you know they're just they're so intense and action-packed that you just you're waiting who's gonna die next Who's gonna die next? Oh, they're gonna die next. Okay. <laughs> it, just, it was really good. Really, 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 really well done. Um, and so it ends with uh, Ed and Peggy escape by distracting Hanzi. Uh, threw something on his face. I don't know what it was, but it looked pretty painful. Um, it may have just been water. I don't know. Uh, it could have been hot water. I think it may have been hot water because she was talking about making tea. But anyway. Obviously, I can't stop saying good stuff about this episode because it was amazing. But there are certain things I do want to talk about really fast. I'm not going to make it too long because I know this review has gone on forever at this point. Peggy, I said I'd talk about her. Oh my gosh. Like, Kirsten Dunst, erase Mary Jane from your history forever. Like, that was a poorly written character. You can act. I totally believe you can act now, because Peggy has done a complete 180, and I love it. Like, at the beginning of this episode, Lou's, Lou's talking to her, and she just, she's completely standing up for herself and for Ed. Uh, somebody says something about Ed that's mean, and she's like, hey, like, you know, getting mad at them. She's totally playing the little Weasley cop at the hot, at the, at the motel, like, he's watching some show, and she, like, sitting there talking to him like giggling and totally playing him I'm just like oh my god <laughs> like she her character has just grown so much from being this little housewife that would well I don't want to be in any trouble and oh but Ed Ed wanted me to do this and it's like she first of all she's still a little bit psycho like in the beginning she, we're actualized <laughs> you know just really weird but there are these moments where she just stands up for herself because of all everything that's going on, she just decided, I need to stand up for me. You know, do what's best for me. And she totally grabbed a hold of that. And she does. And her character's so much better for it. You know, Ed, his character, it's still a good character. But his character's not as strong right now. Like, he's kind of, he's kind of just going through the motions at this point. Like, everything, it's almost like he's... It, and, once again, like, his character is very well. Jesse Plemons really plays this, I mean, at this moment, he's playing this very kind of out of it. Like, everything that has happened, he's kind of like, this, is, this isn't real. You know, like, it, he looks like he doesn't believe anything that's going on. Totally understand that. You know, all of this stuff is kind of crazy. Um, so, I just, I love how the characters, you know, Ed started off kind of this, you know, seemed kind of bumbling, you know, didn't really, didn't really know stuff, but, you know, he had a plan, and he was pushing forward in that plan, to now he's just kind of, like, shell-shocked, like, he doesn't know what's happening. Peggy went from being this, this housewife that only did what her husband said, didn't want to cause anybody any trouble, to now she is, she's an independent 
woman, you know, one of those, one of those women that's not going to take any crap from anybody. Um, and, you know, so the, their characters are just really great right now. I, I already talked about, you know, opening it up with the book. Um, I really hope they, they kind of explain what all of this is leading towards, you know, like, what, what is the purpose of all of this? What's the purpose? Of, why is it being told in a story-like fashion? Because, I mean, the first first season had that same old, you know, this is a true story, the names and names of the people have been changed out of respect for the dead, you know, all the, all the names, all the rest of the details have been kept the same. So it was still, they still had that kind of story feel to it. But this is like, they had a movie starting off, you know, the Massacre of Two Falls, they have this book now. What is the purpose of all this? Is there a purpose? I really hope there is. Because that would just, that would be brilliant. That would be a brilliant turn to take this. Is that this is all a story being told for a purpose. Um, so, that was brilliant. Uh, and just, uh, it's really, like, it's really hard to talk about every little thing. But the one thing that I really, really, really think is worth mentioning is just the cast. The people they've chosen to play these particular parts are brilliant. Um, I already talked about Kirsten Dunst, you know, how her acting is really great in this. But watching Lou in this, watching Patrick Wilson play this part, which, you know, he looks... He, I have this, I have this habit of seeing somebody be like, they look familiar. What are, what are they playing? And then someone will be like, well, they've been in a lot of stuff. I know they've been in a lot. Patrick Wilson was somebody that I didn't really know before this. Like, he looks kind of familiar whenever I watch. I'm like, oh, he he looks like he may have been in some. He owns this part, and this has probably been one of. I, I was talking about his character, how he's been very serious. There's a lot of emotion going on in this episode, and he carries most of them. I think that's just brilliant. Um, obviously, Hank, it, Ted Danson, he, he just, he, he brings it. He really does bring it. He, he plays this part of this quirky cop who just really has this m sense of moral um, and this never, never say die spirit. And Mike Milligan plays his part very well, you know, talking with Kansas City. Um, they just they just click so well. It, it's really hard to put into words like exactly what makes them click, but they do. You know, it, you can just every time you watch an episode, you can feel the chemistry between all the actors and actresses. Like everybody works so well together, and I love that. You know, in in the first season, it was kind of like you had um, Martin Freeman's character with Billy Bob Thornton's character. Um, Martin Freeman's character with, what's her name? I forget it now. Uh, M Molly, the, the, she's a little girl now, but she was the cop in that one. Martin Freeman with this other woman, Martin Freeman. So it was mainly, you know, Martin Freeman interacting with everybody. You know, it was them playing off of his character. And this one, it's been everybody playing off of everybody. They've all had their moments where they interacted with each other. I just, I think that's brilliant. The fact that you can have this big cast and loop them all together to where they all meet at one point. I mean, just, I have to applaud. I would applaud if this were not so late at night and I didn't want to wake people. But I mean, just, the, the fact that they're able to do that is really brilliant writing. The way they've really orchestrated all of this, all of the meetings, all of everything working together has been great. Um, so, <laughs> I, I think it'll run out of good things to say. Uh, looking forward, I hope that the, I hope that the story element comes back into play for the final episode. I hope that the UFO is not just this, it, it <laughs> I hope it's not just this moment of, Oh yeah, it just comes whenever it's needed for the plot. Um, I hope there's an actual explanation of some sort of why it's there. 
uh, why it keeps showing up the most opportune moments. Um, obviously, this net, the final episode is going to be about Ed and Peggy, what happens to them, what happens to Hansi, what happens to Mike Milligan, and how Lou plays a part in all of it. Um, so I'm really, you know, I'm really excited to see where they take this. I'm really excited to see what the point of all of this show has been. Uh, you know, what what it's leading up to. So, I, I mean, I, I'm done talking now. I'm, I'm officially run out of words to say, describing this episode. What did you think? Let me know in the comments down below. Leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed this review. Um, Fargo. <laughs> really, really pulling it off. Ten, ten out of ten. Five stars. Two boot thumbs up. All of that stuff. Yeah, just... Absolutely great show, and I'll see you at the next review. Peace out.